And so I believe the unbothered culture is really a culture where we experience deliverance from the penalties of people's views and people's judgments. Yes, this may be me. Yes, this might be me. But I am not going to live in the prisons of what you feel about where I've been or where I'm about to go. I am unbothered. Now, the reason that is also important is because it is a culture of invitation. It is an invitation. It is an invitation. Think about how backwards it is for people to have to come to church and pretend freedom. Think about it. Think about how absolutely derelict it is for the people who have the healing power of God to qualify who needs it. Does this make sense? Now, the reason this is such a strong message is because when you teach this, what do you think the name of the spirit you confront is? Hypocrisy. You deal with Pentecostal hypocrisy, apostolic hypocrisy, Chicago hypocrisy, preacher hypocrisy, hypocrisy on all levels. If people cannot get healed because of the hypocrisy of the people that's supposed to be doing the healing, that place is going to come under the judgment of God. Amen. Bible says it begins first in the house of God. Y'all quiet already. All right. Deuteronomy chapter 9 is where we're going this morning, teaching you how to be an unbothered people, an accepting people, a people full of the love and the forgiveness of God, a people that despises hypocrisy and dualist standard. And in Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 13, in the New International Version, it reads, and the Lord said to me, I have seen this people. How many of you know the Lord sees? How many know the Lord sees? Can you hear? Do I need to sign to you? How many of you know the Lord sees? He sees who you are, where you are, what you've done, what you want to do. He sees what the person next to you has done. There is nothing hidden from the Lord. The Lord has seen this people, and they are a stiff-necked people. That's a word for rebellious. Now look at verse 14. I love this passage of Scripture. Leave me alone so that I may destroy them. And blot out their name from under heaven, and I will make you, this is to Moses, a nation stronger and more numerous than they. Now, this is traditionally, and people who can't really read teach this like Moses changed God's mind. And I say that a lot of biblical misinterpretation is really the product of the public school system because we don't teach accurate reading principles. And you have to use the verses that are before the one you just read to understand what this means. There is not a man on earth that can change the mind of God. Because if a man could change God's mind, it means that he can affect God's perspective. And God beholds everything at once. So then what does this segment of scripture show? It shows that God said some things to Moses to test Moses. Moses was not persuading God. God didn't need to be persuaded. But God was trying to find out if Moses was ridden of self-righteousness. I'm going to prove it. Leave me alone so I will destroy them and I'll make you a nation stronger. So I turned and went down from the mountain, this is Moses, while it was ablaze with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. When I looked and I saw that you had sinned against the Lord, you had made for yourselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. You had turned aside quickly from that the Lord had commanded you. So I took the two tablets and threw them out of my hands, breaking them into pieces before your eyes. Look at verse 18. Then once again I fell prostrate say prostrate say prostrate i fell prostrate before the lord for 40 days and 40 nights i ate no bread oh y'all not saying amen i drank no water i know i know because all of the sin you had committed doing what was evil in the lord's sight and arousing his anger i feared the anger and the wrath of the lord for he was angry enough with you to destroy you. Look at this. This messes me up. But again, the Lord listened to me. And 
and the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him as well but at that time I prayed for Aaron too we're going to work with this subject a prostrate people a prostrate people a prostrate people first of all hello second of all God has an order oh that you would understand that everything that operates in the world has to operate in the order of God and a part of God's order is not just rank and rule but it's also posture and what I'm finding is that God's people have a problem maintaining proper posture they have a problem with understanding how to place themselves we are in such a liberal democratic carnal society that our rights to our personality very often make us abdicate the right posture in God and there's a lot of people who miss out on promise because of bad posture now when I say posture you mean sitting erect right you mean adjustment but no there is a such thing beyond physical posture and it's emotional posture there is a such thing called psychological posture. I believe there is also a thing called relational posture. And when things are not postured appropriately, they miss out on provision. They miss out on prosperity. But the greatest consequence of a bad posture is no real promotion. Now I want you to open up your life and think about what a life looks like without consistent promotion. And many of you, very frankly, don't have to look that far just look at when the last time you were lifted up look at when the last time you radically shifted in your money or in your opportunity or even in your clarity or in your reach look at the last time there was a vortex in your life and radically you were changed maybe the problem is that you've not properly inspected your posture you have to be careful about how you approach certain things in God. And what I love about this story is that God says to the leader of Moses, or the leader of the, Israel, uh, the Israelites, get out of my way, leave me alone so that I can destroy them. Now, what you don't realize is that is a posture test. God does not want to be left alone, okay? I, I want you to get that in your mind. He does not want to be left alone. God wants to be sought out. He wants to be pursued. He wants to be approached. So then why did he tell Moses, leave me alone? Because he wanted to test how much Moses knew about him. If Moses didn't know enough about God, then what Moses would have done, to be very honest, is exactly what Matthew Stevenson would have done. Had God said, leave me alone, get out of my way so I would destroy them, do you know what I would say? Father, not my will, but thy will be done. Kill them all. They're inconsistent. I'm just being very honest. They're disloyal. They're full of Jezebel. They're rebellious. They're sneaky. They're indecisive. They're disloyal. They're grown. Don't know what to do. They, they, they make up their own standard. Can't be corrected. Can't be chastised. They're overly sensitive. They're eager. They're premature. They're confused. They're full of lust. I would have named off all of the things that deserve for me to agree with God but what would have happened was God then would have known in me how little I knew about him he would have looked at me and said you know so little about me that you would name off the obvious things about my people in your inability to see what I'm doing in the midst of what they're doing in your inability to perceive what I'm creating in the midst of who they are. Every person that's going to lead anything must be willing to see, love, reach, fight, talk beyond obvious behavior. How close to God do you have to be to interact with the obvious? We are in a dodo realm of discernment where people only interact with what's easily seen by the eye. And it reveals how distant a people is from God. It doesn't take the Holy Ghost to see somebody is a drunk. It don't take the Holy Ghost to know somebody's full of lust. It don't take the Lord to, or the Spirit of God to reveal somebody's gay. All of that stuff manifests 
in the flesh because it's under the flesh eating. But what takes real discernment is to be able to see beyond the flesh into the core of man and that's how we lost this generation. Say, duh, duh, dingle, dingle. Leave me alone so I will destroy them. Get out of my way so I will destroy them. Moses says, and the, and the, 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 the verses 21, 22, and 23 are, are where I'm going to really help you understand this. Moses says, no, please don't destroy them because these are your people. Is there evil? Is there rebellion in this text? Is there distraction in this text? Is there idolatry in this text? Absolutely. So when you find that God chooses to withhold his anger, it's not because he's blinding himself to what he is. That's the power of being like God. Granting mercy, I'll get there at, at 1030, is not ignoring what's happened. It's choosing to release from judgment. The victory and the maturity is in your knowledge of what's wrong and your choice to release people from the consequence. God said they are rebellious. They are stignet. They have an orgies around this little cow. Now that's how you know people are bound, Danny. Last time I checked, a cow wasn't even a sexy animal. You could have got a cougar or a jaguar or something a bit more seductive. You wouldn't got a big old uh, 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 cow. Grand. How, who get turned on by a cow? But that's how you know that they were so demonized. What I love about this is the example in Moses. Pay attention. Because there have been people, men, who knew how to prostrate themselves. We have yet to see a prostrated people. God's been trying since the Old Testament to get an entire nation to prostrate themselves before him. Now, what does that mean? To prostrate means to abase in reverence. That basically means to stretch out and to lay out in acknowledgement of whatever is before you. So in worship, when men stretch out and when men buy, most of them are not sleeping. Some of you are. Most of them are not going to get a nap. What they're doing is they're acknowledging their reverence before something that is much more powerful than them. It is an abasement. It is a reverence. It is, it is bowing. Now what I love about that is that that was Moses' choice weapon before the judgment of God. God said, I'm about to judge these people, Moses. And what did Moses do? He got low. Now, I'm talking to you about your posture. One of the problems with people who are not able to get their lives together is they're not around prostrated people. They, 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 they're not psychologically prostrated, relationally prostrated. What they do is they walk with people in their own self-righteousness. They view and interact with people with their own self-righteousness. But the Bible says that lowliness is the way to heal people. A lot of your problem is you think more highly of yourself than you are. And we are in a real generation where the message of greatness is a real deal. Now you do have greatness in you. Come on. Tell somebody you do have greatness in you. Come on. Tell them this is your season and you do have a call. But tell them this. Don't get big headed. The average church in America has assumed a posture of pride before God and subsequently God's people. And God's people, all of them ain't clean. Some of them are dirty. Some of them are, are lonely. Some of them are addicted. But Christians have got to get in their head that because you do it right does not mean that God loves you more than people who do it wrong. We don't get it yet. And the reason we don't get it is because of improper posture. And improper posture comes from poor preaching. You have men and women that inflame you, that 
swell you that make you feel like your life is in your own hands well if the Lord were to withhold his hand from you right now you'd be like Nebuchadnezzar eating the grass of the earth he prostrated himself and the Bible says after he prostrated himself the judgment of the Lord did not come now here's what's going to infatuate you in verses 21 through 23 of this God is reminding God or God is saying Moses is saying to God why a judgment wouldn't work and he never says it wouldn't work because uh, uh, they're not going to learn God's statement to Moses was to appeal to his ambition let me kill them so I can make you better very prototypical fleshly life how many of you I almost called you something how many of you people throw people under the bus to make yourself look good don't lie in God's house how many of you are quick to out talk about release further post tweet like share when it comes to somebody else's inadequacy or insufficiency and then make sure you hide your divorce your adultery your lust your hookah bar your smoking your stripping your prostituting you may not be whoring for money but you whoring for an ordination you're both whores just in different streets what you got to do is prostrate yourself so that you don't think that your career in whorism is better than my career in whorism at the end of the day we all need the goodness of God I said that gossip is born from an unprostrated people. Jealousy is born from an unprostrated people. Judgment, Joe Ugly, is born from an unprostrated people. When people prostrate, they're looking to the floor. Why? They're fearful that if they look up that the holiness of God might devour them. So they're not studying you. They're not looking at you. They're not critiquing you. They're trying to live postured right before him. pride ego arrogance it's the culture of America's church it's so normal it's normal and you know what I believe God is like I would rather make sure backsliders and broken people stay away from y'all that's why your church ain't growing until y'all get it together so that then when you get it together I can trust you with broken people there are preachers in this city who say I stole their members and I ain't walked in none of your churches. What's happening is your arrogance is becoming a strong drink and broken people are leaving you because you're too arrogant to change. I said that. You're too arrogant to retire. I said that. You're too arrogant to apologize. So the easier thing is to say I'm stealing your people because it's harder to humble yourself. The wrath of God is coming against idolatry. God is looking for a prostrated people. A people who will get down. Posture themselves right. When Moses got down, here's what came out of his mouth. Run till that. What came out of his mouth was, God, if you judge these people, this is your own inheritance. If, 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 if you allow your fire to burn in these people, these are going to be your name, your reputation going down. So now Moses is passing the test because he is seeing what God is protecting. God had no intention on destroying them. He wanted to see what it would take for Moses to destroy him, which is why when Moses tried to destroy him by striking the rock, the Lord took him out of here. He was never trying to destroy Israel. He was trying to see if Moses thought that Israel deserved judgment. Let me help you with this. God will always uphold his name. Slap somebody who musty, tell them God will uphold his name. Come on, slap somebody with an overactive sweat gland, say God will uphold it down. Obey me, tell them God will uphold his name. 
he will uphold his name and what God was doing in Moses was trying to figure out if Moses was more committed to his name but when Moses said if you destroy this people it's your name that's going to be impacted and there is one thing that ain't ever going down whether it's heaven earth or hell the name of the Lord will remain consistent when God looked at Moses and he said okay now that you're prostrated you got the right perspective I want to make sure that you're in this for me and not for you I want to make sure that you are in this to uphold my name and not your personal brand and not your personal ministry he will uphold his name and there are things that God is doing for you right now not because of you but because of him there are things that he is doing not because you deserve it not because you've been doing good but because he's got a reputation to uphold and if he don't do it it's going to affect his name he will uphold his name he will uphold his name he will uphold his name that's why he's going to save your children they deserve hell but he will observe uphold his name that's why he's going to heal your body it's not because you got the right diet and you're disciplined he is in this to uphold his name his name is why the earth is still up and the integrity of God is going to keep going the name of the Lord endureth and if it means forgiving you he will uphold his name And when you come to the point in your life where you think that you're being rewarded for your consistency or the position of your heart or your personal goodness, you are already at the door of deception. He told me this morning, I'm going to uphold my name. And I'm going to uphold my name for the heathen. Because what you don't realize is God does not just have commitments to his people. He has commitments to those that ain't chose him yet. So he does not care what you think about who deserves to be saved. Or who deserves to be anointed. Or who deserves another chance. Who do you think you are to stand as judge and juror as an accuser on who deserves favor? In the next chapter he tells Moses, I will show mercy to whoever I want to show mercy to. And I will show my goodness to whoever I show goodness to. What was he doing? Making sure that Moses never forgot that this is about the name of God. My preaching is about the name of God. The character of God is what I'm doing demonstrated which is why I must live prostrated the unbroken culture is the prostrated culture you find out somebody fall somebody trip somebody slip and I'm gonna tell you another problem you people are nosy that's what it is black people are nosy y'all love current updates on stuff oh, oh what's going on none of your, none of your business What's going on is you need grace. What's going on is you need mercy. What's going on is if any one of you be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, I can't get help this morning, you who are spiritual, you who are spiritual, bear the infirmities of the weak. So the real question is, who can God trust you with? It takes nothing to be trusted with the wealthy. Nothing. It takes well character to be entrusted with the broken. God is coming after pride in this season. Pretty pride. Nice, nasty pride. He's coming after hypocritical pride, every form of arrogance. And you know, one of the realms of pride is entitlement. He's coming after your feeling of entitlement in the house of God, in the move of God, in the presence of God. And he's trying to figure out what you think you deserve so he can decide what he's going to take next. It's about being a prostrated people. Prostrated people, they're quick to repent quick to turn, quick to welcome. Many of you, somebody walked in here smelling like they life. You'd grab your purse with your little food stamps in it. Cause most of you ain't even got a 401k. I don't know what you're hiding it from. Who are you sitting by? Or you're sitting with them. Y'all even got, y'all got segregation in where you sit in the sanctuary. 
you heathens are separated by social groups and where you sit. You got the cool kids section, the anointed people section, the son section, the daughters section, the backslidden section, and the problem is ain't none of you prostrated. There is only safety in prostration. We go to war for people who would walk away from us at the drop of a hat. That's your sister pre-test. That's your new friend pre-test. So it's bad when God sends broken people to the house. And many broken people are very well put together. So they'll sit and watch how ugly you are. How demeaning you can be. How harsh and unloving you are. Prostrated people are people who carry glory. I just don't have time for that. You could have fooled the heck out of me. Most of you are addicted to social media. If I were to tell you, leave that phone alone. And I'm going to tell you the problem. This generation lives for the internet. You people prove yourself to everybody. You got to make sure. If I were to tell you, take away the internet for eight weeks, most of you would start shaking like crackheads. And the, and the problem is, is you need a constant information stream to compare yourself to. When if you were prostrated, y'all won't say, oh, we're quiet today. What happened to the praise break now? I said, if you took your way from the addict juice of the internet, you wouldn't have nothing to compare yourself to but the last instructions God gave you check in buffalo wild wings with the sis y'all are all fake phony and I wouldn't brag about being at beat ups anyway the chicken wings are 99 cent for five God is grieved with pride He's grieved with ego. He's grieved with arrogance and church gangs and, and glorified thugs in the house of God. We in worship, our hands are lifted, your eyes closed, looking at somebody because of what they got on. You hypocritical answer, animal you. How dare you miss God's presence to inspect who's sitting next to you? How irre You are just as much an idolater as anybody else. We all worshiping and crying. You seen that squinching. Mm. God ain't showing you nothing when we worshiping. And if he is, ain't got nothing to do with who worshiping. It's got to be you. Prostrate. It's, it's not just something you do during a song. It is a life posture. When somebody comes along that I'm tempted to judge, I get low. Lord, help me with this. Oh, y'all don't want this as grown people. I get low, Father, help me. I don't want to slip into temptation by thinking my latest victory is stronger than this. Let me get low real quick. And I know this is strange to you because y'all not used to prophets crying mercy. My God. You're not, you're not used to prophets of God that cry out for release from judgment. Y'all are used to prophets of God calling for judgment, getting happy when people fall. But God is raising up merciful people and they shall obtain you can't even shout they shall obtain mercy and you need mercy because you jacked up even if you've been hiding your family issues that listen wait till you get promoted you know what the devil's gonna do he gonna go in your heart and find a door that's unmanned and put his finger on one of your daddy's demons and it's just gonna come out a little different that's all he's gonna say duh, 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 duh. And you're going to end up just like who you judge. It's easy. I grieve. There are times when I'm praying and the Lord will show me an email, an inbox. He'll wake me up and show me a text message and it'll break my heart at the absence of mercy in God's people. And the hypocritical nature of it is we all beg for mercy when it's us. If we could put your life on this jumbotron, better yet, let's do your thought life. 
if, if I could put your thoughts about your brother, your thoughts about your sister, don't get quiet now, on the, on the big screen and we can all watch it, would we really think you was the sweetest person in the world? Would people really be coming up to you asking you to mentor them? If the content of your heart was on display? No. No. God is calling for a prostrated people. You see a drag queen, a drug addict, a dope fiend. Even now in all nations, our temptation is to be merciful to that type of people. Let somebody be sitting next to you with a tambourine and, and, and catch the Holy Ghost like he a flu and start screaming and hollering. And because you've been in prophetic training or you on an old crazy prayer team, and you get to walk the aisle, you move in instant judgment, and you call their praise religious. And most of you don't even read your Bible. You, you don't have accurate Bible reading. Just because somebody's running and you quiet don't mean that they're doing too much. It may mean that you ain't doing enough, and that's why you broke, broke and that's why you defeated, and that's why your lonely was too much for them, may not be too much for you. You must stop your judgment. Oh, the worship team, they didn't hear it today. You can't even sing. y'all are laughing because it's funny you're judgmental easily accident oh there she go again running running well from the looks of it you could stand to follow her because you ain't ran period all week get your tail behind her this is the only aerobics you gonna get in the next month maybe you should get up and run behind her and stop judging her if some people don't run they're gonna be sifted by the devil this is the only time they get to tame their body what you should do is move your nappy head butt out the way and let them run and then say praise them lady I don't know what you are running after I don't know you weren't running for but I'm not gonna judge you because you don't do it like I do go ahead run ma'am all right let me move out the way You roll your eyes, people are oh, here she go again. How dare you? I know when the spirit is left. I can tell when the anointing is gone. <laughs> See what I'm talking about? It's judgment. And churches are empty because of their judgments. And most of them are not applicable to their leaders or their leadership. God is trying to make this place a prostrated zone. We're humble. Not, and not just before God, but before God's people. Most of you have no future without Facebook. Your entire company, your entire idea, your entire plan. If Donald Trump decides tomorrow to take the internet away, all y'all going to be in a public aid line. Humble yourself. Stop inflating yourself against your brother. Ask questions that matter without motive how you doing and not because you want recent update y'all why can't I get an amen no nobody's saying amen when's the last time you asked somebody hey are you okay what's up can I do something for you without motive without trying to use them without trying to pull a favor it's right posture now if you think this is harsh it's because you ain't prayed all week I said that too. If you think this is harsh, it's because you've not talked to God. You've talked to your personal needs. You've talked to your personal desires. Because out of heaven is coming a mandate for humility. Out of heaven is coming a mandate to be prostrated. Out of heaven is coming a mandate for people to abase themselves because they don't want what God pours out next to crush them. Many of you are calling for a favor your life ain't ready for. You know, with the next level of favor comes another level of scrutiny. With the new money you're going to make, do you want to be examined to that level? Want to buy houses and stuff? Do you want to be scrutinized? With every raise, there is a scrutiny. There is a scrutiny. You've got to humble yourself. Now, many of you get away with this because you're not vocal. But it's in your opinions, which is why even a mental prostration is necessary. Let me get low. Lord, I don't like it, but I'm willing to forego it. 
I'm willing to switch how I see this for how you see this. That is my daily prayer. Lord, I see it this way. Now, don't lie. Be honest. God, I see it this way. But I'm definitely willing to switch how I see this for how you do. Help me. Come on. Help me see this right. Help me to know how to adjust myself. I'm not going to try to change him or her or them. What I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust because I don't want to use what I know to puff me up. I want to live low. <laughs> and our problem, prophetically, we're not low enough yet. We're not low enough. We're not. We want leniency, understanding, and we only want mercy about us. You got to get a little lower. With God, there is a re I have seen the types of stuff that's coming out of heaven to this people. It's it, the only way to describe it is that it is really bizarre favor. It's just only God could do what He's trying to do. I mean, taking people from remote parts of the earth to connect them to strangers to do things. There are, you know your next level is in a person with your antisocial self? With how you abuse relationships and friendships? Your next level is coming through a person. And God's going to arrange for divine meetings. If you are rude, fake, pretentious, inconsistent, evil, unkind, what you're going to do is you're going to show God, I don't want the next level. And in every level of power, there is a demand for your personality to change. When you are a king, you can't act how you did when you were practicing. There are behavioral modifications for where God is trying to take you. And the way you start, prostrate. Lord, here is my view of people. This is how I, I change my view of people I don't like. And there be very many of them. But this is what I do. God, you are God. You see how easy that was? If you think about somebody you don't like or somebody you judge, if you just say, you are God, doesn't that deal with all of your stuff instantly if you mean it? You are God, not me. I didn't die for them. I didn't shed blood for them. I have no clue what their motive is. I know their character, but I don't know what they really want. So I'm not going to put myself in the seat of judgment because in the future, I'm going to need mercy. And the only people who don't need mercy are those who intend to not make another mistake. If you have made your last mistake, then be as judgmental, unchangeable, critical, rebellious as you are. But if you know, sometimes even in trying to please God, you make mistakes. Even when you're trying to do something that is the will of God, there is a way for your human nature to try to reach for the will of God imperfectly. You don't want God overlooking the fact that you made that mistake and what you thought was obedience to deal with the fact that you did it imperfectly. What do you want the Lord to see? My verse is this. If the Lord should mark iniquity, who would stand? The mercy of God. Father, help us around the world, not just this church, but help us to adjust and get in posture. There is a placement you're requiring in our heart, in our attitude, in our mind, in our will, in our emotion, there is a posture, Lord. Help us not to exalt ourselves above you, against you. Help us not to grieve your standard for our lives, but help us to get the right posture. And we know that your word says that humility comes before honor. So help us to live humbly before you. And Lord, as you sin, thousands upon thousands of broken, lame, maimed people to this place. Help us not to interact with them arrogantly, proudly, boastfully, thinking that we got victory because we got victory. But help us to uphold your name. Thank you, Father, right now for upholding your, 
of holding your name. You've done it for us. You've done it around us. And thank you that you will continue to uphold your great name. We praise you for that in Jesus' name. Come on, if you're grateful that the Lord upheld his name, give him some praise, will you?